In 2010, Amazon released an ad for their Kindle app. A woman starts reading a book on her Kindle iPhone app. She then moves to her Android phone, opens the Kindle app, and starts reading where she left off. It remembered her page number. On the surface, this just looks like a neat feature of the app that improves the user experience. But when Apple CEO Steve Jobs saw this ad, he was not impressed. If apps like Kindle are interoperable, iPhone users can easily choose an Android for their next phone. This was not something that Jobs was willing to accept. The story of the Kindle ad was the opening statement in the US Department of Justice's recent antitrust lawsuit against Apple. The crux of the lawsuit accuses Apple of abusing its market power to keep both customers and developers locked into the Apple ecosystem. It's undeniable that Apple is one of the most successful companies in the world, with a market capitalization in excess of $2 trillion and annual profits close to $100 billion. Their profitability is thanks to the exorbitant prices of their products, with many of their phones selling for over $1,000. They also charge a 30% commission on all in-app transactions. There's nothing wrong with a company being successful. Indeed, there's nothing inherently wrong with a company being a monopoly, so long as their market dominance is based on superior products and innovations. In this video, we'll critically analyze the case against Apple to see whether the company's success is based primarily on innovation or if it's an anti-competitive monopoly that needs to be reined in. One of Apple's most controversial business practices is the 30% fee that they charge on all purchases in the App Store. This 30% fee also applies to in-app purchases. Subscriptions are subject to a 15% fee. Unlike Android, Apple does not permit apps to be downloaded from outside its own App Store. This has resulted in criticism from many app developers. For example, the music streaming service Spotify does not allow you to upgrade to premium from within the app. If they did, they'd be forced to pay the 15% fee to Apple, which they view as exorbitantly high. If you want to upgrade to Spotify Premium, you need to sign into your Spotify account on a browser. This is an inconvenience and almost certainly decreases the number of Spotify users who upgrade to Premium. In 2020, Epic Games, best known for making the popular Fortnite video game, sued Apple, accusing them of violating antitrust laws. A judge ultimately ruled that the 30% fee itself was not anti-competitive. But the court also ruled that Apple must allow third-party apps to point users to alternate payment methods. While this was technically a win for Epic Games, it had no meaningful impact. Apple indeed started allowing apps to point users to alternate payment methods as required by the court. But Apple still charges a 27% commission on in-app purchases and a 12% commission on subscriptions. This is only a 3% reduction in cost, which is roughly the cost of payment processing. To reiterate, Apple charges this fee even when the transaction is made outside of its own app store. Apple also forces users to view a scare screen, implying the third-party payment method may not be secure. There's basically no benefit for third-party developers to use alternate payment methods, as they end up paying roughly the same cost. So developers are still stuck paying the 30% App Store tax. The European Union has tried to crack down on the App Store tax by passing the Digital Markets Act. The Digital Markets Act requires companies like Apple to enable alternate marketplaces other than the Apple App Store for developers to distribute their apps. Again, Apple complied with the letter of the law while not substantively changing the economic reality. Apple will indeed allow third-party app stores for iPhones in the EU, but they will continue to charge a 17% fee on all downloads and in-app purchases from a third-party app store. They will also charge a 3% fee for payment processing. This is optional as a third-party app store can choose to use a third-party payment processor. A third-party payment processor would likely charge a similar amount, so this is basically a pass-through fee. If you add these together, the fee is 20%, which is indeed significantly lower than the 30% fee they charge on their own app store. However, they also added a so-called core technology fee of 50 euro cents per app download. This is a new fee that Apple invented that is not charged on their own app store. This fee is charged even on free apps. Because most apps follow a freemium model, they may end up paying more to Apple under this new system. Furthermore, Apple forces the user to view a scare screen if they use the third-party app store, and the user has to go through an arcane process to set up the third-party app store on their iPhone. Many have called Apple's new system malicious compliance, they are attempting to technically comply with the Digital Markets Act, but they make use of the third-party app store so unfavorable that developers are effectively forced to continue using Apple's own app store and paying the 30% fee. Apple only unveiled their new policies early this year, and it's unclear whether or not the EU will accept them as compliant. As far as the US is concerned, the 30% app store tax has largely been resolved in Apple's favor in the Epic Games lawsuit, so the DOJ's monopoly case focuses on other alleged anti-competitive behavior. There are two main reasons that Apple is so profitable. 
The first is the 30% tax they charge on the App Store, which yields extremely high gross margins. The second reason is the very high prices of the hardware itself. Their latest model, the iPhone 15, starts at $800. The most expensive version of the iPhone 15 Pro Max costs $1,600. When the iPhone was first unveiled in 2007, it was indeed revolutionary. There is nothing else like it. So you would expect it to sell for a premium price. When Apple first started selling the iPhone in 2007, its starting price was $499, or about $760 of today's dollars adjusting for inflation. Today, there are dozens of smartphone manufacturers offering a wide range of specifications and price points. As technologies mature, you would expect their prices to decline. Indeed, today you can buy capable Android smartphones for a fraction of the inflation-adjusted cost of the original iPhone. Yet 16 years later, the cheapest iPhone 15 costs $800, which is actually higher than the inflation-adjusted price of the original iPhone. So how has Apple been able to maintain its premium pricing despite the explosion of competition? From the very beginning, Steve Jobs and other Apple executives feared that smartphones would become commoditized and profit margins would eventually be pushed down by market forces they needed some way to differentiate the iPhone. One of the main selling points of the iPhone is its cutting-edge chipset and computational power, which allows it to run advanced mobile video games. Over the years, Apple's made numerous incremental improvements to the iPhone's computing power. As games become more graphically intense, you need to buy the latest iPhone to play them on full settings. On the surface, this looks like Apple's maintaining its market position through innovation, but it's a bit more complicated. The advantage of the iPhone's computing power could be almost completely negated by cloud gaming. In cloud gaming, the game is run at a data center and streamed to your device. For this to work well, you need a very fast internet connection. But your phone only needs minimal computing power because the game is not being run locally. Apple knew that this would be a big problem. An anonymous Apple executive is quoted as saying, quote, Imagine buying an effing Android for 25 bucks at a garage sale and it works fine, and you have a solid cloud computing device. Imagine how many cases like that there are. To prevent this, they implemented arbitrary technical rules for third-party developers, making it impractical to sell cloud-based games on the App Store. Apple has over 50% market share in the US by number of units sold, but this significantly understates their market dominance. Because iPhones are so much more expensive than many Androids, the average iPhone user is far wealthier than the average Android user. Wealthier consumers are more likely to make in-app purchases and are thus more valuable to mobile game developers. Many mobile game developers can't justify the expense of making a cloud-based game if it can only be played on Android. Thus, Apple's decision to effectively ban cloud-based games also negatively impacts Android users by denying them cloud-based games which would otherwise have been developed. One of the biggest mysteries that many tech analysts have grappled with is the absence of any so-called super apps in the US. In China, the ubiquitous WeChat app allows users to do just about everything. In addition to its core functionalities as a messaging and payments app, it also hosts thousands of so-called mini-programs created by third-party developers. These mini-programs are basically apps within an app. They include games, social media, consumer loyalty apps, etc. Super apps like WeChat seem to provide a superior user experience because you can do pretty much everything within one app instead of needing to switch between many apps. That's why WeChat has become so popular in China. But why don't we have anything similar in the US? According to the DOJ, one of the reasons is Apple's anti-competitive behavior. If you only use a super app, you'll spend less time using Apple's native apps and features. Since the super app would also be available on Android phones, the smartphone hardware would be commoditized. iPhone users could more easily switch to an Android phone. Knowing this, Apple implemented a number of restrictions on app developers in the US. For example, many programs within a super app are not allowed to offer in-app purchases. This makes it almost impossible to monetize mini-programs, so there is no incentive for developers to make them. This effectively makes mini-programs unviable in the US. Apple does not enforce these same restrictions in China. Perhaps this is because WeChat is already so dominant in China. The cat is already out of the bag, so it's no longer viable for Apple to try to throttle super apps in China. But they seem intent on doing whatever they can to prevent any super apps from being developed in the US. One of Apple's most petty yet effective anti-competitive strategies is their iMessage feature. Unveiled in 2011, iMessage allows iPhone users to message each other through Apple servers instead of the standard SMS text messaging service used by cell phone carriers. iMessage supports superior features such as the ability to react to messages, as well as higher resolution photos and videos. By default, when an iPhone user messages another iPhone user, it uses iMessage, and when an iPhone user messages a non-iPhone user, it uses SMS. 
iMessages appear in blue bubbles, and SMS messages are shown in green bubbles. In 2013, Apple's senior executives debated internally whether or not they should make an iMessage app available to Android phones. This would enhance the user experience of iPhone users when they text their friends who use Android. But they quickly abandoned this idea. In the words of one Apple executive, this would simply remove an obstacle to iPhone families giving their kids Android phones. The iMessage experience is superior to that of SMS and is a competitive differentiator for the iPhone. But is it really anti-competitive? Surely, Apple shouldn't be obligated to create an iMessage app for Android phones, but it's a bit more complicated. There's nothing special about the capabilities of iMessage itself. Other messaging apps like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger have functionality that is just as good. The difference with iMessage is that it can seamlessly switch to SMS if you're messaging someone who doesn't have iMessage. Apple does not allow third-party apps like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger to access SMS. Thus, it is impossible to use a third-party messaging service and to send a message to an iPhone user who does not already have that third-party messaging app installed. This effectively locks in iMessage as a default messaging app for iPhone users. Since they already have iMessage pre-installed, they don't want the trouble of downloading another app. Perhaps the most outrageous thing about iPhone messaging is their color choice for SMS messages. Apple chose a very bright green color, which makes the white text difficult to read. The contrast ratio violates Apple's own guidelines that they give to third-party developers. Thus, they intentionally chose a color scheme to degrade the user experience. So why do this? The goal is to create societal pressure to coerce people into buying iPhones. If all your friends have iPhones but you have an Android, you may feel social stigma because you'll degrade the experience of a group chat when you join. This social stigma is especially effective amongst adolescents who are immature enough to think that getting their parents to buy them a $1,000 iPhone somehow makes them cooler than their classmates whose parents can only afford to buy them a cheaper Android phone. There have been numerous reported instances of high school students being kicked out of group chats or otherwise bullied for not having an iPhone. This is all part of Apple's plan to extract money from insecure teens. It's been highly effective, with the iPhone's market share being the highest amongst teenagers. It is estimated that up to 85% of teenage smartphone users in the US have an iPhone. One of the most ironic things about the current situation is that in the early days, Apple was a beneficiary of antitrust legislation, which they are now allegedly violating themselves. In the 1990s, Microsoft was the most powerful consumer technology company by far. Apple, by comparison, was an up-and-coming startup. To maintain its market dominance, Microsoft engaged in many anti-competitive business strategies, some of which directly affected Apple. For example, Apple developed a media player called QuickTime, which was available on both Apple and Windows computers. QuickTime worked almost flawlessly when played on an Apple computer, as it was indeed a well-built software. But Microsoft set up Windows such that QuickTime would not operate reliably. This tricked users into thinking that the QuickTime software was unreliable, when in reality it was being sabotaged by Windows. They didn't want Windows users to use QuickTime, they wanted them to instead use their own Windows Media Player. One can easily draw parallels to what Apple is doing today with iMessage. Many iPhone users assume that Android phones are inferior, due to the inferiority of SMS compared to iMessage. But the root cause of this poor user experience was a deliberate strategy by Apple. In the year 2000, Microsoft lost an antitrust lawsuit, so they were no longer allowed to throttle the performance of competing softwares. In 2002, Microsoft was also required to make many of its APIs available to third-party developers, including Apple. This was a huge boon for Apple, because they can now make the iTunes Store cross-compatible on Windows PCs. By this point, Windows had by far the largest market share in the personal computing market. The ability of Windows users to access the iTunes Store was a major boost to iPod sales. The success of the iPod eventually led to the iPhone, which made Apple into the behemoth it is today. While it's almost impossible to prove a counterfactual, one could easily argue that Apple owes its success in a large part due to the government's enforcement actions against Microsoft in the early 2000s. Now we've come full circle. Apple has become the dominant consumer technology company and is using anti-competitive strategies of its own to stifle innovation. They're trying to prevent the next disruptive technology company, the proverbial next Apple, from taking their throne. Alright guys, that wraps it up for this video. Do you think that Apple is a monopoly? Let us know in the comments section below. As always, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Wall Street Millennial, signing out.